joining us. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna get, oh, Patricia was muted. <laughs> Thanks, yes, thank you, pass it <laughs> off to put to Michelle. <laughs> Good morning, we're gonna get started with the land acknowledgement as we will um, for each of the um, sessions that we do together. Like I said, in orientation, we're gonna take turns. Um, the staff that are joining us um, and me and Patricia, but we also are hoping towards the end in the handful of um, sessions toward the end of our time together that some of you will volunteer to lead the land acknowledgement. So be thinking about that. The WIC SAP office um, and also where I'm at in my house is uh, physically in Olympia on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, uh, specifically the Nisqually and Squaxin Island peoples. Olympia and the South Puget Sound region are covered by the Treaty of Medicine Creek, which was uh, signed, uh, it was a 1854 treaty between the United States and nine tribes um, around kind of the head of the Puget Sound area. The tribes on the treaty were Nisqually, Puyallup, Dilakum, Squaxin Island, Sahomish, Dechas, Tepixen, and Squaidal, and Sehewamish. The treaty was signed in December uh, by the governor and superintendent of Indian Affairs, along with the chiefs and headmen and delegates from those tribes. The Puget Sound War followed. Uh, it was an armed conflict that took place in the Puget Sound area of um, 1855 through 1856 between the United States military and um, members of these uh, tribes, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Puyallup, and Klickitat. Um, this, there was a lot of loss of life in this conflict and it ended with the wrongful execution of the Nisqually chief Leshai. In 2015, President Obama signed the Billy Frank Jr. Tell Your Story Act into law. The interpreter asked, what was the name of the law? Uh, uh, Billy Frank Jr. Tell Your Story Act. Um, redesignated the wildlife refuge um, in honor of the Nisqually tribe leader and treaty rights activist, Billy Frank Jr., who died recently. So there's also a Medicine Creek Treaty National Memorial there at the refuge to commemorate the Treaty of Medicine Creek, um, which of course is signed under duress. So that's our little bit of history of the land here, where I'm coming from, we're all coming from different places. So if you know the land that you're on, uh, the indigenous people of the land that you're on right now, you can pop that in the chat as well. We can share that.
Great. Thank you all so much. Okay, Patricia, you're on. Thank you, Michelle. This is Patricia. Good morning, everybody. Look at that sunny virtual background. Um, so now we have about 48 of us. The This slide is talking about um, what is your why. But before we get into what is your why, I wanted to mention a couple of other grounding um, techniques that we can do that I thought of last night. And one is putting your hand on your heart. <sighs> Placing your hand on your heart. And another one is placing your fingers on your pulse point. And we have many pulse points, right? Throughout our body, the wrist, the neck, and just feeling that blood go through us can be very grounding. We're human, we're living, we're alive, we're breathing. The blood is flowing through our body. So um, we feel it's really important to know what brought you to this point, to register and participate in Advocacy Corps for Sexual Assault Advocates. And this picture is of my great-grandson, and he's my second great-grandson. His brother is four. So my daughter is a grandmother. That's shocking to me, but it's true. My daughter is a grandmother and this is Joaquin. He is going to be one year old in August. He's the one I mentioned stood up at 10 months old. Thank you, Soleil. I think he's a cutie too. He's just full of personality, very strong. Um, and so he is my why. The generations that are coming after me are my why of why I want to work with this huge group to end gender-based violence. Also, I don't have a picture I'll have to add for the next Advocacy Corps of my maternal grandmother who is Tara Umara Indigenous from Mexico. I'm doing it, my, my ancestors are my why and the future generations are my why. And as I've mentioned to you all, um, we've done this many times. So we've had time to reflect on what our why is, right? And I've distilled it down to this, <clears throat> um, Joaquin and Hippolita, my grandmother and my great grandson and humanity. Um, we don't know if we have an aptitude for this work until we know and um, I can re remain calm and think clearly in a lot of really tough situations. And so it's worked for me. I hope that you have a journal that you can write in and you can write some reflections as we go. And what I'll ask you to do now is if you could put in the chat, if you could share with us, oh, and it's happening already, uh, your why. I feel, you know, really frustrated and enraged with the situations that humanity is having to experience. And so do, being part of the solution is very, very helpful. And it helps my heart function, being part of the solution and meeting people, others, and working shoulder to shoulder with them. It's uh, so rewarding. I can't even express it in words. And so Michelle is going to read us some of the responses. Mm -hmm. There's only one, it's only my response at this point, but I do this work for young me, uh, for my father uh, and my queer community who has been impacted by so much violence. Um, my two girls, someone, uh, Olivia says, Emily, to do, to, help to educate young people and prevent what happened to me from happening to others. Our future. 
I'm a survivor and I've always said that if I could help even one other survivor, it would all be worth it. I do this for my first love who is a survivor of child sexual abuse and for my future children, my sisters and my younger self. I'm a survivor myself and every woman in my immediate family it needs to stop. Yeah. My daughter, I want her to know what equality is in this world. My younger self, my friends that I've watched experience and share in my trauma too. I do this for young me, my mother, and those who are minoritized genders. My sister who is no longer with us because of the impact of sexual violence my daughter, my younger self. Uh, support and seek justice for farm worker women. Healing my ancestral lineage. Sense of meaning and purpose. generations and ending cycles. Changing the sexualization of gay and queer youth from within and from society. Survivor me and of child, I'm a survivor myself of child, youth and adult sexual and gender violence. Fellow butterfly survivors and those with us no longer For Native communities struggling with historical trauma. Advocate and seek to eliminate oppression for marginalized populations. Oh, my gosh. There is a bajillion. Young men. Uh, statistics say that young men are perpetrators of sexual violence. I believe more men should be involved in the awareness, prevention, and education of sexual violence. Men need to teach, coach, and mentor boys and young men to provoke, promote healthy relationships. My sister, who is a survivor. My aunt, who I found out had a hard marriage. My daughters and their future children. Do this to help those who can't with the memory of what my mother had to go through. My younger self, my sister, my mother, all the women in my family are survivors. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Very powerful. Thank you for sharing. We are in community with one another, um, all coming to this work and this learning process with really um, strong and important whys. Patricia, do you want to say why we do this exercise? Yes. Okay. So, um... I think there are many reasons why we do this exercise. There's layers to everything, right? But it's really important that we as new advocates are in touch with why, why we wanna do the work so that um, when we're frustrated or get burnt out and it does happen, it will happen, we can go to our why and remember and be re-energized and invigorated. Um, Human conditions are human conditions and they're happening all the time. We're in a pandemic right now. And I've got serious family stuff going on right now too. Yet I love my work and it feeds my soul and my heart. And so we felt it was very important to incorporate this into Advocacy Core 
So you would know from the beginning, I didn't know from the beginning what was my why. I was just doing it because it called to me. But um, I got burnt out, you know, and, and did other types of work, which is fine. Each person is an individual. So remembering our why is what's going to help us with our self-care too. Because that is loving. That, you know, that picture right there, look at that little charmer. He's just so charming. And so, yeah, it's, uh, did I miss anything, Michelle? Would you like to add anything? As I said, I'm going through some challenging times. And so I'm really depending on Michelle to fill in the spots where I, I missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we try to be very, we're very, um, <laughs> we do this together a lot. So we just very naturally kind of go, go back and forth. But yeah, you're absolutely right, Patricia. It's that uh it's the way we fight cynicism that is one of the ways that um our exposure to trauma or our secondary trauma we might or will experience can make us angry make us cynical um and so coming back to this it helps to fight against that cynicism and that's a really important place to remember why it is that we're doing this and Patricia is absolutely right. This work will always be here. So when it's time to take a break or to shift to something slightly different and yet still connected, that's all okay to do. We can kind of pop in and out of doing this work to take this knowledge we get from doing this work, taking these trainings into all aspects of our lives because we're always going to be encountering someone at some point who's experienced sexual harassment, sexual violence, uh, intimate partner violence, right? Um, who experienced trauma or might be having a crisis. And so all these skills are useful in anything that we do. Thank you, Michelle. So this next slide, what, what's an advocate's role? And before I start in the bullet points, I would like to say that when we present in front of a survivor, whether it's on the phone or in person, um, in our office or at the hospital, before anything is even said, we wanna make sure we're grounded because our energy and our body language speak volumes before any words come out of our mouth. So let's do the is, provide information to inform choices, support safety, serve as liaison between survivor and systems, inform of their rights, listen, inform of other resources. And with that in the, you know, this list, it's also if they need ASL interpretation, if they need Spanish language interpretation or a Vietnamese interpreter, all those things are, are what we would make sure they're connected with. And isn't, we don't make decisions, rescue, investigate, be friends with, provide therapy, loan money, take home, judge or blame. And the one that sticks out to me the most here is investigate. So a survivor that presents for support, they're not going to tell you the story from beginning to end of their experience. And we as advocates have to be okay with that. We're not going to be asking questions. Whatever they want to share is what they want to share. This is their life. And we will get the bits and pieces that they want to share with us. And we'll go from that. We're not an investigator. And um, so this is a really good list on what an advocate's role is. Um, when you serve as a liaison between the survivor and systems, you have to make sure the survivor has language access if that is a need. I'm reading from my notes now. The role of an advocate is to be present for the survivor, to inform and present options, 
to respect their decisions, even if you don't agree with them. The advocate practices healthy boundaries at all times and doesn't become their only support system, but helps them identify one. And it's modeling healthy, constructive self-care and behavior. Yes, like things like breathing together with folks um, sometimes is something that can be really powerful, um, even just really simple things. Um, I hope that we can kind of portray to you the real basics, the real kind of, we tend to overcomplicate how to work with people. And I think we really wanna kind of take it down to the studs of being present with people, modeling, um, active listening. Those are the most important foundations of um, this work with survivors. One of the things that is, um, that can be a real challenge uh, for a lot of folks is kind of thinking about what the differences are between therapy and advocacy. Um, so we know that there's no one way to heal from sexual trauma. Psychotherapy and support groups might be really great healing tools for a survivor that you're working with, but they are not a replacement for what you can provide as an advocate. It's okay to, be, to have an advocate and to have a therapist. In fact, that's super useful, right? So the differences between advocacy and therapy is that we provide things like crisis intervention, right? Therapists are not generally on call for you when you're in crisis. Um, also, that's usually the first step in intervention is that somebody's reaching out uh, because something has happened to um, uh, to cause a crisis or to remind someone of something that happened maybe even 20 years ago. Crisis is not about, you know, that, that a sexual assault has just happened yesterday. It's about my reaction to a sexual assault that happened whenever, could have been yesterday or 20 years ago, right? So crisis intervention, um, coping with symptoms, um, self-determination and autonomy feeling heard and social support are important factors in healing that advocates can provide. So while a therapist is going to help alleviate the symptom, get to the root and kind of unpack those things, we're helping people kind of survive, right? To kind of get through. Uh, and sometimes that includes coping mechanisms that are not um, the most like traditionally healthy. Sometimes that means that they're, you know, people are coping by drinking, they're coping by cutting, they're coping by um, um, just going on lots of dates or um, it can look really different all the time. So we're, we're trying to work with folks on um, coping with their symptoms, giving them ideas for that. Um, and, and even if it's just really simple grounding techniques, um, thinking about their trigger plans, thinking about reducing any harm with existing coping skills that, or um, mechanisms that they're already using. Advocates are in a unique position also to engage with survivors from different cultures who may require specialized cultural support outside of therapy or addition to therapy. We are not the transition between crisis and, and a therapist. Uh, we're just different. Um, if, if there's anything that you take from that, that's something that uh, I really want you to hold, that, it's, that an advocate is important and one is not a substitute for the other. We also uh, really look at broad um, elements of victimization. So, you know, we look at housing, we, you know, um, there's a specific focus for therapists on emotional and behavioral responses kind of only, right? But we're looking at legal aspects. We're looking at, you know, medical aspects, um, uh, housing. Uh, th there could be so much uh, parenting, all kinds of, of broad um, kind of issues that happen when you've been traumatized, you've been sexually assaulted, or you have a history of sexual abuse as a child. 
we normalize and we validate. This is a really important kind of bumper sticker for advocates that we normalize and validate the experience, right? When we've had a terrible experience, we can feel um, crazy. We can feel um, out of control. We can feel like we should be over it already. And our job is really to validate and normalize. Yeah, it doesn't, it's not that simple, right? what you're saying to me, that makes sense. That's common for survivors, right? You're having a normal reaction to a horrid, abnormal situation, right? So our, our big goal is to do that normalize and validating more on the surface, whereas a therapist is doing a processing of the trauma, a deeper exploration of those feelings. That doesn't mean we don't necessarily get deep. That's definitely what happens, but that's not our ultimate goal. Uh, we provide specific psychoeducation about sexual assault, tell people about what a trigger is, explain um, what dissociation is, and we're going to get into all that about session three or four. I can't remember quite. Um, and so just being able to explain those kind of things, explain things like tonic immobility or the freeze response, right? We want to provide those educational pieces so people can make sense do that making sense of what's happening to them, making sense of their reactions that also help provide the support for the normal, normalizing and validating and fight the isolation that happens when we feel like we're weird or we're alone in our experience, right? We identify and respond to cognitive distortions, but we don't resolve them. Um, that's the therapist is gonna try to resolve them, right? So a cognitive distortion is, you know, um, patterns of thinking or believing that are false or inaccurate. Um, uh, things like, it's my fault I was assaulted, right? We identify and respond to that. That's a normal, like, for example, if somebody says to me, it's my fault I was assaulted, I'd be like, you know, uh, a lot of people feel that way. Uh, that's a super normal reaction to, um, being assaulted. And it's also an easier way to kind of react because how do we go, um, how do we really go into the fact that somebody we know or we love could do this, right? That we jumped to that, we jumped to that blame. So we identify, you know, that's, that's a normal kind of thought, normal reaction, but it's not true, right? So we are telling them it's not true, but we're not going to resolve that blame. That's a deeper exploration of the blame to unwork. Uh, we're doing that kind of more surfacing and you're saying, it's not your fault. And I understand that you feel that way. I can't do anything about that. And I get that. That's going to be work that, that you're going to do over time, that you're going to continue to come back to. Um, but I just really want you to hear me say that it's not your fault things like that. Um, we also don't give any specific advice where um, some therapists might, some therapists might not too. It's kind of a more of a practice um, kind of preference, uh, but um, we're never gonna give specific advice. And that's a really hard one because people will come and just be like, what would you do? You know, and I just, I can't say what I would do because my situation is just different. What I need and how old I was or am, all of those things um, kind of come into uh, play in decision-making. I also never wanna take away a choice when I can reinforce a choice of a survivor. And we're gonna talk a lot about choice today. We want to, so if somebody says, what would you do? I'd be like, you know, I, I'm not quite sure. Let's talk about what you want to do and let's see kind of or what you want to happen right now or happen next. That we're kind of looking at those more immediate needs, even if it's not a crisis, one step at a time, not really doing any of that long-term planning. Although if that's something that somebody wants to do, but kind of trying to pull back and say, okay, I hear you want to go to college, but right now you're, you're having a hard time taking a shower every day or, or getting out of bed. So 
what are those small steps that are going to get us to you going to college that we can kind of distill down and think about your day to day coping. Um, an advocate's role with children can look um, a little bit different, but also the same, right? We're still providing information to inform choices. Um, we have that additional layer of um, ageism and adultism, the, the just very fact that children don't have power and that people are making decisions for them. So figuring out what choices they can make and making sure we're reinforcing that. Because when we exercise choice, we start to build back those muscles that um, we, we don't have when we've been having choice, the biggest choice ever taken away from us, right? So providing information to inform choices, even if there's those little choices that, that a child can make um, or a young person, teenager, right? Uh, support their safety. I always really start with young people by just introducing myself and making sure that the child wants to talk to me uh -huh, and that they're not forced to be there. How, what can I do with my body language, with my, um, with, you know, introducing myself, with just having conversations with them to let them know they're not forced to be there and also that I'm there for them. If a child is open and comfortable to continue conversations with me, and I make sure that they understand what my role is, that it's this, you know? Um, and if they don't wanna to talk to me, no one will force them. But it's, it's again, a, a liaison between a survivor and a system. Sometimes a liaison between a, a survivor and a parent. Um, to let them know what their rights are, because even though they are children, they still have rights and it's good for them to know what they are in, kind of most developmentally appropriate ways that we can. Listening is, it's like one of the last bullets on here, but should really be the first because that's the most important part, right? Listening, validating, normalizing. And then of course, letting them know of other resources. Children are very smart. They're also very resilient. And um, it's, it's, a really, it's really hard to, for a lot of people to work with children. And so one of the ways that I became really comfortable working with children is to reframe how I was looking at it and being like, this child is four and something terrible happened to them that is hard to fathom, right? Uh, and you can get really stuck there. So starting to kind of reframe that saying, this child is four. What a great time for an intervention, because I think about all those adults that I work on the crisis line with who are 40, right, who are 40 and didn't get that intervention and what an opportunity that is. So I always try to kind of turn it a little bit so that I can cope better with doing really hard work with children, right? So maybe that's helpful for you. Um, but the, but that's something that's been very helpful for me when working with young children or hearing terrible stories about what's happened to children, right? That intervention is happening now or we're able to have an intervention now. So, um, and kids are really resilient. You have an intervention at four, it's gonna be much better outcomes than when there's not, right? Um, so um, that's also a good way to kind of look at that as well. Um, they're going to come back for support if they feel that they trust you, especially when we're talking about teenagers. Um, also, kids are always hungry, so have snacks <laughs> or offer snacks uh, for things. Have stuff to play with, um, you know, just spending time with the child. Um, some considerations is like, you know, how do we let them know that they're the client? Um, I would always give them a business card. That feels important. Um, that's just one strategy. Um, and direct questions to them, even when the parent is there, you know, like explaining to both the parent and the child in a way that the child is understanding and then asking the child, does that feel helpful? Is that, you know, um, you know, is it, 
is this idea um, one that you're interested in? Um, we explain again what our what our role is, um, and we're going to talk about mandated child abuse reporting um, Monday in the second session. We talk about ethics. If you're working with a family, but the child is the one that's the survivor, always try to have another advocate to work with the parents. It's sometimes difficult for a child to build trust with an advocate who is also working with their parents. That doesn't mean that um, everything is private or confidential from those parents necessarily, but it does mean um, that, you know, parents really struggle with, with a, a choice and control issue as well, right? Because they some things happen to their child that they didn't know about or they can't believe. Uh, if it happened by their partner or their father, something that's hard for them to wrap their head around, they really need another person to have that conversation with so they can process that without blaming the child. Because that's, part, that's a natural part of, um, of a process is that is the denial and the blame um, because it's an easier place. So there definitely needs to be somebody else that's safe to be able to process this and be like, I'm having such a hard time believing my child and somebody else to help reinforce, yep, that's normal um, because you've known this person for 20 years and you thought you knew them. And also, you know, we have to believe the child. And so what can we do to help you move through that? What can we do to kind of, to get you there or to get you only to like have these conversations with me and with the child, like practice reinforcing that? Those are all really important. Um, processes. Okay, now we take stretch break because we take breaks as often as um, we can. So take a stretch break, a couple minutes. Um, Michelle? Yeah. I would like to share with the group what we learned from the Idaho Coalition. Please. A stretch. A stretch and breathing so you're standing with your feet together and it's called mountain pose. And then you put, if your shoulders are okay to do this, you'll put your arms up as you inhale in a mountain pose, right? And you're really grounded to the earth like a mountain is. That's the inhale. And then when you put your hands back down and oh, I forgot something. So when you come up, you're separating your feet to shoulder um, with the part and bringing your hands up. That's your inhale. Then when you exhale and you hold it for a few seconds, then when you exhale, you bring your hands down and you bring your feet back together. So just wanted to share that as we are sharing throughout these sessions, different ways of being grounded. Um, I have a question for either Michelle or Patricia, whoever uh, has the answer. Um, I was wondering if- Can you say- What? Can you say what your name is so that we can oh. identify you? <laughs> I'm Sadie and my pronouns are she, her. Great, thank you. Um, I was wondering if after this training, we're certified to work with children as well, like all ages, or is there a, an additional thing that we go through to work with children? No, that's correct. It's it's for all uh, adults and children. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so what's next? Patricia, you are next. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> so this slide, core principles of trauma informed care. And as you can see the grid, safety, ensuring physical and emotional safety. And we've talked about that when we are coming into contact with the, for the first time with a child or an adult survivor, um, their safety is supported by you presenting yourself in a grounded, 100% focused way on the survivor. 
active listening, etc. That's going to make the, help them to feel safe. Trust, maximizing trustworthiness, making tasks clear, maintaining appropriate boundaries. And we talked a little bit, Michelle talked a little bit about the boundaries in, you know, questions that come up. A survivor wanting us to give them the answers. Our boundaries are, well, um, tell me what, what you're feeling about that. What do you think? Putting it back to, the, to them so that they can think it through. And that trust, having quiet time during these sessions with the survivor is really important. So one of the other things is being comfortable with the quiet because people are thinking and processing and that's really important. Choice, prioritizing survivor choice and decision-making, supporting survivors control over their own healing journey. Collaboration, maximizing collaboration and sharing power with survivors. The collaborate, you know, all these really go together, right? They're all connected. We are working with a whole human being that had an experience and validating and mirroring that to them is critical because they may not be feeling whole. They may be feeling broken and wounded, etc. But their essence of who they are is still there. And that's what we're working with, right? That's what we want to affirm with them. Emp empowerment, identifying strengths, prioritizing building skills that promote survivor healing and growth. They can be saying negative things like, I can't even, you know, think straight. I'm so stupid. And what we could say to that one possibility is, I don't agree that you with that S word, the stupid word that you used, you are here with me. I feel dirty. Yep, yeah, that's right, Michelle. Anything like that. You are here. You got yourself to the center and you're reaching out for support, always validating each step, each half step they make is huge. Cultural relevancy, ensuring cultural applicability of services and options, sensitivity to the role of culture in lived experience and decision-making. And if you're not equi equipped, if your center is not equipped to do this cultural relevancy work, there are resources out there. And it's really on us as community sexual assault programs and community sexual assault advocates to research what those programs are and do a warm handoff of that survivor to the appropriate program. Michelle, would you like to add anything else? Yeah, um, especially around that issue of cultural relevancy, and we're gonna we're gonna go through each of these in more detail. But always, you know, survivors know best what it is that they need, and so you, you're not alone in finding out. You just ask, "How is your culture, you know, a factor in your healing? What are cultural practices in your?" queer community or your indigenous community that have been helpful for you. Um, I think about um, like um, church as well. You know, I worked with a, a survivor who was, who grew up in the church uh, and he wasn't harmed in the church. He was, but uh, sexually, he had, his sexual assault happened at a different point. But because he was gay, he was harmed in that way. And so one of the things that, you know, we talked about was how much he missed being with God because 
he grew up in the church and it God was really important to him and his healing, but he wasn't, he didn't feel welcome at church. Right. And so we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, what's the, let's talk about the differences between the church and God and what your personal relationship is. You know, I'm not uh, an expert on God, but you're an expert on what your experience is. And I think that, um, if you feel a connection to God and you need God, you can still do that. And let's talk about ways that you feel like, you know, that's possible for you. Um, so just sometimes we just don't know. Uh, it just wouldn't be my assumption that this queer man that I'm working with uh, is missing God. Uh, and so that's just something that came up and in, in our conversation when I was working with him. And we strategized about how he could be connected in that way. So you never know, but survivors know best. And that comes up when we make space for those conversations. Yep, they're the experts on their own life. And now we're gonna go through each one in a little more depth in the next slides. So fostering safety, the bullet points, ground and center ourselves, be consistent, predictable, non-violent, non-shaming, offering strengths, non-blaming, affirming wholeness, being respectful. And non-violent, it's like, well, of course I'm not gonna be violent, but that begins in our brain with our thoughts, judgments. So those are things to be very, very conscientious of. And what would that look like in practice? What would it look like with young people? These are all things to reflect on and um, before we're meeting with a client, right? In this training. And so please share your thoughts in the chat. Yes, explaining what to expect. Yeah, the tone of our voice. Yes. Body language. Honesty. True. No one person knows everything. And it's really important for us to be honest and transparent about that. And when a question comes up and we don't know, we don't know. Share that. I will find out. Let's see what let's see if we can find out together. Good comments. Yes, sitting if the client's sitting sitting with them. Yes. If the if it's a child sitting on a little short stool so we're at eye level. Mhm. Mm Empathy. Thank you. Excellent. Everybody is right. We learn together from each other, right? Thank you for sharing with each other. Candace, I like this. Thanking them for allowing you to be there with them, reaffirming a safe space or safer space, right? That um, I, I really want to emphasize these celebrating of very small victories, very small accomplishments. You got here today, you got out of bed, and a lot of people in your situation would struggle with that, right? So that helps to affirm strength and affirm that wholeness. Um, another thing that helps affirm that wholeness is this is only one aspect of your life, right? To, to see the whole picture. That doesn't mean it's not the, a huge thing. It doesn't mean it doesn't impact all of it, but it's only a portion of who you are, right? I can be a survivor, but I can also be, 
you know, an advocate. I'm a survivor, but I can also be uh, a wife. I'm a survivor, but I can also be a parent, right? There's all of these other things that we are to help affirm the wholeness of who someone is, um, right? As Patricia said, these are all aspects that kind of overlap, like a Venn diagram, right? Safety is trust, is choice, like they all kind of flow together. Um, but because we're, you know, I don't know, we're doing a linear situation, but just know that they're all, <laughs> that they're all combined. Uh, it's almost like we should make a better, instead of having a linear chart, have, have more overlapping circles or something. Maybe we'll do that later. But um, trauma-informed care uh, recognizes the long-term and pervasive impact of violence, right? Again, you if someone is sexually assaulted yesterday, that doesn't mean that they're, um, that the impact of it is going to be immediate. But it does mean that it could last a long time or can come back at unexpected times. So when we're trying to provide trauma-informed care as advocates, we have to recognize those long-term, that this is um, only a part of who we are, but it's always a part of our experience, always going to be a part of our journey. A lot of us are able to sublimate or um, kind of transfer, uh, transform our own survivorships into this work by doing healing work or doing helping work like this. Um, um, so it's always interesting to kind of think about if that's our experience, uh, our own long-term journeys with, um, you know, recovering from different traumas in our own lives and kind of thinking about, yeah, that's really different than um, my other friend that I know or this client that I work with, that we're all having our own really specific experiences, but we recognize that they're all long-term and can be pervasive and impact all aspects of our lives, not just like our emotional um, state, but our, our physical bodies, our uh, sexuality, our partnership, right? Um, fostering trust also means that we have clear boundaries and defined roles, as many of you said in the chat, uh, when we're trying to foster safety, we're also trying to foster trust, and this is one way that we do it through um, explaining what it is that we do, what we can and can't do, by never making things like promises um, or saying things like, it will get better, um, or I know, right, um, you know, I know that this will happen for you, or different things like that. Um, one way that I help to, to validate, normalize, or give hope is to say, you know, I've worked with, a, is to kind of shift that a little bit for me not making a promise or saying, you know, I know this thing will happen by saying most survivors feel like this is never going to get better. I can't tell you for sure what your experience is going to be, but I can tell you that uh, in my experience working with survivors that most people, you know, do feel better. They do find ways of healing and coping that that that's the majority of people that, that I work with, that this is their experience. So I can kind of give some hope without kind of saying, here's what your journey is going to be. Um, Mike Liu, who's the therapist that works with um, a lot of male survivors of sexual assault and abuse, uh, says that people are often asking him, you know, how long am I going to be like this? And I, I really like his answer because he says, you know, not as long as you fear, but longer than you'd like, right? Which feels so true for me, right? In, in, my, in my own survivorship and my own, you know, working with survivors for many years is that, you know, it is, we fear we're never going to recover. We fear we're going to be, you know, feeling bananas forever or feeling dirty forever or never able to have sex again or these different things, right? And, um, it's, it's not true, but our fear is real and deserves validation. So not as long as you fear, but longer than you'd like. It is hard work. It does take time. It's not fair that has to take hard work and your hard work and impact your life because it wasn't a choice that you made. 
Um, and yet here we are, so we're gonna do our best, right? Uh, so I always really like uh, his framing on that. Um, I also see Lynn's comment here about being conscious of facial expressions, which I think is super important, right, for uh, in deaf culture, right, that your facial expression is part of your, is, is a really important part of your language, right, Lynn? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's one of the, it's an integral part of the language is that our facial expressions are included into the language expression itself. And you, your facial expression has got to match what your body is showing and what your body is feeling. And other than that, there's a disconnect uh, with the victim or the client, uh, adult or children, either way. Yeah. And so it's it's just most important you, to not have a flat face or non-expression, but just make sure that the expressions match the situation and the tone it's really, it's really important to have the facial expression, the tone, and to show that. And you show the tone through your, your examples and that, you know, here's an example, like, I, let's see, I want to tell a friend that my mother passed away yesterday. So my facial expression might be somber. Will it be somber or will it be happy and smiling? Hey, my mom died yesterday. No, I mean those two, those two messages don't match, and so the tone is is shown in the facial expression. And it's really critical that that matches. Thank you for sharing, Lynn. I think that's really important and and absolutely translates to um, to any language that you're using. You know, ASL, Spanish, English. Like you really want you know, your tone um, to match your facial expressions and your, and your body language. So, um, because those of us that have been traumatized, especially at, at young ages, are really sensitive to sensing your energy your, through your facial expressions and your body, uh, because that meant safety or predicting uh, unpredictable situations that we weren't looking at words because our developmental stages were much younger, right? So um, that's another reason that that can just be really important that people will read something else beyond if their experience of trauma is, is really long-term and pervasive in their childhood. Transparency is so important. We always wanna be clear and honest, um, as many people said here in the chat, um, because uh, uh, we just it, it, always being honest, <laughs> it's just important because um, we will really damage any relationships we have with anybody by um, setting up um, um, unfair expectations um, or um, if we have a tell, like I, <laughs> when I was first um, and Avika, I started working on Crisis Line um, about 20, so 21 when I started. And I remember I felt really confused about whether or not I was supposed to talk about myself, about what my boundaries were. And I was talking to this woman and she was like, what's your name? And I made up a name and she was like, you're lying. And I never did that again because I was like, wow, how does she know? That I was lying because I one I'm terrible at it terrible at lying um and so instead you know I wish I would have been like you know I'm not sure if I'm supposed to tell you what my name is <laughs> instead of just like lying <laughs> and just being honest about that like I'm new and I can't remember like the protocols around me sharing my name but I can see why you might really want that so what if we just call me this for right now um and then like, I'll try to figure that out for the next time, right? You know, like what could I have done that would have been more honest, more transparent in that situation because I just totally damaged um, by being really bad at lying <laughs> and also just making the choice to lie about what my name was. Oh, so this is interesting too about <clears throat> when you started doing trafficking work, um, 
you told you were told never to show facial expressions while hearing a survivor's story because we don't want to influence the narrative. However, I found that most success in um, oops, it moved a little bit. Let's see. Oh, however, I found the most success in communicating with survivor by actually showing facial expressions, of course, <laughs> as long as my expression was open, encouraging and comforting. Um, right, like just having an open like I'm listening and I'm interested and I'm attentive right without being like super like, um, you know, I'm sad for you or things like that, but like how you can because you also want to show people like you're not hurting me with your story, which I think it can also be a barrier if they think like, oh, I don't want to tell you this icky thing because I feel like I'm going to hurt you with that information. You know, my uncle, um, we can't ever talk about what I do for work because he flinches every time I say the word sexual assault, the term sexual assault. He he physically flinches his face. Um, and I'm like, OK, I don't want to talk to you about this. <laughs> You know? And like, if you were having this experience and you were also a survivor, you'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to talk to you about my experience of sexual violence. So again, those facial expressions are, are just so it's like, where's your happy medium of showing I'm open, I'm receptive. And when I'm talking and I'm explaining things that my facial expression is and tone is matching, you know, the appropriate emotion of the, of, of that, um, statement, right? So thanks, Sol, for that. And you were also, this is when you were also working in, in Morocco, Soleil, right? So there's also that, those cultural differences as well, right? Yes, it was when I was working in Morocco. Um, there were also issues around, around like contact and whether like the rules were like, not the rules, but like the suggestions were like absolutely no physical contact, but this was a culture that was very tactile and the survivors felt very isolated because after this happened to them, nobody wanted to touch them. Um, so I would often start off a meeting with a very light touch on the shoulder, like nothing that was too invasive, nothing that was um, like just when I was directing somebody like, okay, we're going here. I would like just touch their shoulder lightly. And based on that reaction, which was usually very welcoming, I might then proceed to not be overly tactile, but just show that like, I'm not scared to touch you. You are part of regular society. Like this does not change who you are and how we treat you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for that. So that's also really important. Okay, let me check the time. 10.30, we're done at 12. Would folks like to take a break now? Um, just pop in the chat if you're like, yeah, let's do a bathroom break for like five, seven minutes. Great, let's take a break. I'll pause the recording. Oh, happy to see a dog there, Lynn. <laughs> I love it when the dogs visit. All right. Um, my dogs are sleeping so hard out in the living room. It's very calming when I see them both just like snoring. And the one is having his dreams, right? Yes, he has big dreams. My old man Jones, he has really big dreams. He's barking and running. It's the cutest thing. Okay, back to safety and trust. Um, so uh, safety and trust develops with our first words. Like, like just like we've been saying, Patricia has been saying, um, like I talked about when I lied to that person about my name, you know, our safety and trust develops with those first words. And sometimes that's like an intake uh, and that can be really one-sided. And so we wanna ensure that we're having a two-way conversation. Um, I know uh, be, doing this work means also like being really self-aware, um, self-aware of like if we have a tendency to eye roll or to, you know, whatever it happens to be, we have a, we have kind of a fidget that we do, whatever those things are, we just have to be aware of them 
so that we can, you know, be consciously working on those when we're trying to be present and be grounded um, in meetings with folks. So one of the things that I know about myself is that I love a form. Uh, I'm very um, into forms. So if, if somebody gives me a form to fill out, uh, I like doing it. Um, I want it to be complete. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Capricorn and I have a Virgo rising. And so that's just always gonna be who I am. Uh, so <clears throat> what I know is that when I'm meeting with somebody, especially for the first time, I have to put the form aside because I'm not gonna be present to having the conversation that this person wants to have with me, that's the first time we're meeting, right? That um, it's important that we begin with a two-way conversation and that at the end, um, there's information that I have that I can fill out my form with. We all have paperwork we have to do for our jobs. Um, but we wanna make sure that that happens afterwards. And then if there's anything missing um, that at the end I can say, hey, you know, since we're kind of doing an intake, just a few things that I wanna make sure that, I, that I'm capturing here for my paperwork. Um, and that we're not asking people to repeat stuff that they've already told us through this conversation. And that doesn't mean we can't take notes, right? Taking notes is fine. Um, but that should be a two-way conversation. We have a form, the form is leading us to ask particular questions. So my strategy was always to put the form aside, to wait for the end um, and to kind of see what, what didn't this person tell me that I need for my paperwork. Usually that's like a demographic information, uh, what date did it happen information. I don't know what kind of things might be on your intake or your form, but filling those in at the end afterwards. I think that's a really important first impression to make. Um, and so, um, you know, what's that balance of making sure we're in a two-way conversation that somebody's sharing with us that we're not being investigating, right? But that we are um, we are allowing them in their own time to give information and be thinking about what do I really need to know to be able to help them? Because often it's not that much, right? Especially because we're not investigators. Like I don't need to know who perpetrated the sexual violence. Um, there are some dynamics that might be, you know, um, important to know at some point, but if all they want is a bus pass, I really don't need all that information for them to have a bus pass. All that I need for somebody to be, um, to qualify for services really is that they say that they're a sexual assault survivor. So great here, you know, um, that maybe building that trust, not investigating or getting more information means that they'll come back later when they wanna explore it more, right? So finding that balance between what we need to capture for uh, our paperwork and what and, and how we can just really honor the conversation and humanity of being present with somebody else to make that space for them to want to give you more information. Really importantly, we are that one person in a survivor's life who's not trying to figure out what happened, including them. Uh, survivors are also trying to reconcile and figure out how did this happen? What did I do? What if I would have done something different, right? Uh, their family and friends being like, oh, how did this happen? Police are asking, you know, how did this happen? We have to be that only one that doesn't care. I mean, that we care, but that, that that's not important. We don't have to have a linear um, explanation or a, um, a play-by-play -play of anything. We just don't need it. We need only what they're ready to tell us and we can do some things through active listening that we're gonna learn about over the next few sessions about how we clarify and just kind of check in. And that's mostly to just make sure we're understanding what they want us to know, right? We want to 
introduce a survivor to our program, saying here's what, what I can do, here's what we do here, here's all the stuff we have available. Um, and getting to know the survivors, their needs, their goals, their strengths, what their resources are already. Um, you know, I mean, you don't want to just start referring people when they're like, yeah, I've already been all over town. I've already, I've already, you know, I'm already connected with this and that, right? And sometimes we can tend to um, tend towards, you know, trying to connect people with as many resources as possible when really what they need you to do is sit and listen. And that can feel really weird. And I want to say that um, that uh, I think it has a lot to do with capitalism, <laughs> that we feel like we don't have something to give somebody, that it's not worth anything. Um, and so I really want us to kind of hold that and rethink that, that our presence is important. And so I'm going to continue to kind of come back to that and talk about that throughout um, our, our many sessions, how important that is and how when we kind of are are trained to like give you a thing, give you a referral, make it better, that that's not something that's possible. And maybe that's not what's being asked, that we're really trying to, to take it down and just listen for what is being asked for, what is, what is, what is the need is, and clarifying that, asking about that. And that's something that's so hard, especially with adult survivors of child sexual abuse. I can't do anything to make you safer because this already happened so long ago, right? But you're needing to talk about it, you're needing to process it, and you're needing to do that right now. And so it's a weird place to be at where you're like, I can't go back and do the safety thing, right? So thinking about emotional safety, thinking about that kind of stuff um, when we're working with someone whose abuse happened so long ago. All right, thank you, Michelle. This is Patricia speaking on this next slide regarding fostering choice. So the awareness of power dynamics and how therapeutic relationships can inadvertently mimic abusive relationships. Um, small things like control over the names they want to use. Are they a client? a consumer, a survivor, a victim, mimicking the language and the words they use, pay attention and use those words that they have, that the um, person that came for support is using. Um, I'm gonna go through the bullets now. Personal experience of choice builds the ability to direct life and dream. Giving choices fosters safe relationships conscious, intentional, and verbalized. Involve survivors in program evaluation and design. So these are different layers and different places of where a survivor is at and how they present at your program. And many advocates work with survivors for a long time. And so when they're in a different place in their thriving, um, involving them in program evaluation and design, asking them their ideas is really, you know, a really, really good place to be in where they can give back. And I kind of want to speak a little bit about what Michelle said also, and this goes with fostering choice. As we said, they're all, uh, they all, these, all these intersect. Um, we live in a very materialistic society and yet in, um, in being present and there with the person, that's the most valuable thing we can do is give our attention and our time. And also there, you know, there is the idea of reciprocity. They, they want to uh, do something for you or give back to you too, that's real too. So it's really, individualized. It's really on an individual basis and um, whatever your community sexual assault program, you know, their protocols and their practices are, you will know that also and following those. I just got knocked off my screen where I have my PowerPoint. So one second. And if you, 
all have any comments, please, anything you'd like to share about your experiences, your wisdom, please do so in the chat all the time. We always encourage feedback and sharing of the um, expertise that you all bring. Um, recognize difficulties in involving survivors and the position of survivor advocates and that power dynamics again, right? That has been the power that has been taken by the experience that they have gone through. Um, um, nothing about us without us. Talked about the name choice. And um, some of this you will get from them talking to you, right? You will get that information. And so really listening and paying attention. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, ask permission for everything we do and offer. Giving choices um, can be, I mean, when we do this training in person, we'll pass out paper and we've got four different colors of paper on legal pads and we'll ask everybody, you know, take the, we'll pass them all out and, you know, pick the color you want. We're modeling that, you know, in the in-person trainings. Um, confidentiality and dual relationships. And this quote supports building a culture of trauma-informed care from the very start and through all, all of our interactions with, sur with survivors. It is crucial to the entire process of orientation. So I'll read this, choice. The ability to choose based on your own internal experience what you want physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and sexually, and then to communicate those wants. Consent is an ongoing process of making choices. And there is that fluidity again, right? Yes, Hansel says, one of the most common questions we get asked is, what do I do? Oh, it went away. What do I do? Or they tell us, I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. It's very tempting to jump in and say, do this or do that. But it's important to empower them to choose. In those instances, we direct the conversation and talk about pros and cons on any choices and give them the power of choice. Yes, thank you, Hansel. Mm -hmm. And we're on to our next slide. How much choice does a survivor have over what services they receive? And this is for our reflection, right? How much choice does a survivor have over what services they receive? Where and how they meet with an advocate? How do we build in choices, big or small? for survivors in our service delivery. I really feel like being out in the fresh air is so great when we have appointments. And, and if you can incorporate a little walk, you know, around the area, it really helps, movement really helps. So um, these are all things that we can consider. Absolutely, Patricia, thank you. And I just add, <clears throat> excuse me, I would just add that um, I, I remember working with, I just have so many anecdotes. So if I re also repeat my anecdotes, you know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but I had this woman that I worked with uh, in domestic violence shelter and you know, one of the things that we would do uh, is when somebody, you know, moved into the shelter, you know, they're often in crisis and, and just we built in, you know, this kind of process where we would take them out to the food pantry, which was in the garage, to um, uh, just allow them to pick whatever they saw that they wanted to bring in the house as, as kind of their, um, to make sure they had food that they wanted, that they knew where it was, um, and that they could see that there's abundance of food and anything that they wanted, which was kind of out there in the, in the garage. And I remember working at this woman and she says, I 
she looked at the stereo for so long and says, I don't know what I like. I was given a shopping list and this is what I was supposed to buy. And so I, it's been going on so long that I, I don't know what it is that I like. And so <clears throat> she was trying to get me to help her choose the, her cereal, right? And what's really important is that she chooses her own cereal, right? And that's what we mean by uh, choices, big and small, because how are you going to make bigger choices? You have to exercise. You're going to the gym of choice making <clears throat> by starting to do those little, those little choices. So, you know, I just said, hey, well, you can pick a couple and if you don't like them, you just don't finish them and we'll just come out here and you can pick a couple more to try until you know which one it is that you actually like, right? Um, hence, I'm uh, gonna just pause on that and come back to that in a few minutes. Um, uh, so, so this is what I mean about making those small choices. Uh, another way is just to say, what, you know, when you go into maybe the office where you're going to meet, um, you know, where would you like to sit? Some people feel really comfortably being close to the door um, so that they just feel like they can get up and leave at any time. You know, some people like an aisle seat uh, when they're at the movies, you know, just all these kind of things that you, you know, people have those preference, like I can get out easily, but other people, they don't like having their back to the door. So maybe they want to sit on the far side where they're looking at the door. Maybe they want to, you know, sit on the floor, or, you know, so just offering, you know, where would you like to sit? And then we choose where to sit based on, on that, um, you know, just building in those small choices um, helps build those muscles for future consent, right? For, um, like Patricia said, you got, you know, guiding your own life and being able to dream. Hansel says it happens several times where program participants get demanding and they reach out to just demand things. I figure this happens because we're one of the few resources culturally responsive that has supported them with their needs. But then I don't know if that's a cultural thing or we're doing something wrong that I trust us too much and begin demanding things. I wonder if this happens to other orgs. Um, yeah, when you're a culturally specific program um, or culturally specific advocates within uh, a, a mainstream program, um, the the swath, <laughs> the broadness of services that you provide are going to be much different because building trust in culturally specific communities is huge. Yeah, they trust you, they're comfortable, uh, they might be demanding, <laughs> and, you know, maybe that's okay. Uh, and I don't think that's culturally specific to your particular culture that you're talking about because this is something also that I've seen when I was uh, supervising a Cambodian advocate who spoke Khmer, you know, um, the, the, uh, the survivors that she worked with, uh, she would work with them for years. Um, so, and, and the amount of things that she would help them with, like getting driver's licenses and just things like that, that seemed out of the scope. It's just, it's just the reality of that. I found somebody who understands my culture. This is somebody I trust. And so they're going to be more comfortable with you like family, right? And so that's just the way that looks. Okay. Lynn, did, does Lynn have something? Lynn was asking for the sign that I used for Cambodian. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure she didn't have a question. Okay. Um, so where are we here? Fostering collaboration. Um, we want to do a partnership uh, approach to services. Patricia talked about um, going outside and walking. Um, I really like that a lot because um, it's trauma-informed. Uh, trauma lives in our bodies. Um, it's also when we're walking next to somebody, we don't have to uh, look at them in the face. 
um, I know for me, one of the things that's really hard is to, um, and this absolutely, you know, might not apply in, in deaf culture or with ASL, right? But um, one of the things that's true for, for me in my experience is that I don't want to look somebody right in the face when I'm talking about the hardest thing, most terrible thing that's happened to me. And so one of the things that uh, for me is useful is to, um, that I always find I have the best conversations with people when I'm walking next to them. Like we walk around the lake and we're just talking and moving our bodies and that kind of stuff really helps to kind of, um, kind of move the trauma around and feel comfortable. Sometimes sitting right in front of somebody um, is, is just not what's gonna work for them. And of course, everybody is different. Uh, and so just having those conversations about what's going to be the most um, appropriate for you. I also like walking next to somebody because I, I feel like that kind of has more collaboration kind of just built into it than sitting across the desk from somebody or sitting next to somebody instead of sitting across uh, a desk kind of, sh it, it, it kind of, even if it's not real, like portrays like a like a professionalism uh, or a, um, a hierarchy thing. Like I am on this side of the desk and I have the computer and you are on that side as a recipient of services. That when we kind of flip that a little bit, that helps to just provide a little bit more openness and show we're gonna do this stuff together. Um, that I have knowledge about what services are and you have knowledge about what your experience and needs are. And it takes both of us to figure this out because you are unique in your experience. And that's what I mean about partnership to services. Opportunities to be with other survivors and offer mutual support, like support groups, that's just super useful, right? Uh, it helps to normalize and further validate when there's just more people going through similar experiences and hearing about how they have um, worked through this or that or resources they've been connected with. Um, and that also it's important that, that survivors are able to support other survivors, which is why so many of us that are survivors come into this work because that's part of that healing process um, is that we are kind of um, taking um, terrible things that have happened and, and making them into something useful or more productive. Um, so, <clears throat> There's, there's a reason that happens. And, and so ways that we can figure out for survivors to be in support with one another to offer that mutual support is actually really good and part of that healing, right? It's, it's, it helps solidify the why, <laughs> right? Um, collaboration also gives new source of, of uh, knowledge and strength. You know what you need. I'm here to help you kind of figure it out because sometimes it's not on the surface. That knowledge is kind of buried under here, under all this, the garbage, negative thoughts that I have, um, feeling like I'm wrong always, right? That that's the prevailing thought. That's why I'm asking you, what do I do? Because I don't trust my own, right? So what can we do to kind of build that up? And one of the, the best quotes that my colleague, Chris, who uh, works in um, Iowa, and one of the things that she always says is that advocates are a roadmap rather than a GPS. And that also, again, another bumper sticker for you, um, a real simple way to kind of capture uh, how we do our work, right? So we're looking at the map and saying, which road are you taking? Here's like seven ways to get from Olympia to Seattle. Here's the most straightforward way. Here's the scenic route. Here's the traffic way, <laughs> you know, right? Like, let's look at that and you choose because you turn on your GPS, it's gonna be like, turn right here and turn right there. But when you're looking at that map, you're saying, you know what? I wanna go to Seattle via Spokane. And you get to do that. And me as an advocate might be like, well, that's a weird way to go, but let's do it, you know? <laughs> So uh, I feel like that's just a really good metaphor for, for, for kind of doing this work and thinking about the ways that people go. That maybe you go to Seattle via Indiana, 
but you'll get to Seattle someday, right? Uh, another example is the, um, I worked with the woman named Britt, who's a good friend and colleague of mine when I worked at Safe Place in Olympia. Um, and she's a big fan of um, just doing research with, um, with survivors. So um, there was a particular survivor that would call her and ask questions. And Britt would always say, I don't know, let's Google that. And um, she would just, the survivor would just jokingly, jokingly then call on a regular basis and, and refer to her as Google. Um, and what I like about this is that Britt was saying, here's how I'm getting this information. And also I'm gonna do it with you and we're doing it together. But you're also equipping folks with saying like, this isn't just information for me in my head, that when you're ready to, to Google it yourself, you'll know that that's where I'm just getting this information, right? So I always really liked that approach. And I think that that fosters collaboration and that particular survivor would call her all the time. So it created a really strong kind of, um, it really worked for her uh, and created this, this really strong um, advocacy relationship where uh, she would call for support. And then that would lead them to discussion about, you know, after the resource was, was Googled or the, or the law or whatever it was that she was looking for, that would lead them to have really good conversations about, you know, the context in which she wants that resource or how she's thinking about, you know, going forward or what else she might need, right? So I have, again, I have information and expertise, but it's not useful without the survivor's ideas, goals, and self-assessment, their needs and their desires, their dreams, right? Thank you, Michelle. This is Patricia. Moving on to the next slide, fostering empowerment. Partnership approach to services. The wisdom of both the survivor, the client, and the advocate is appreciated. And really, you know, that's the premise, that's the foundation that we move forward in also with this training advocacy core facilitation. Um, as I said, you know, I'm visualizing us in a big circle, learning from one another. And so that with the client survivor is, you know, two people that are experts, that survivor, that client is an expert in their own life and building on their strengths, identify strength, identifying strength creates more strength, validating their resilience. They came to the community sexual assault program or the um, agency, um, cultural specific agency that could support them. That is resilience right there. And create opportunities for survivors to do and give back when they're at that place, right? And celebrating the whole person the, it is a horrible experience they went through and that many people go through, but they are a whole person still. Building on strengths includes validating their choices, celebrating the whole person, social roles, roles strengths that have nothing to do with the abuse, giving opportunities maybe they can be a mentor or an, um, have an advisory capacity with the agency. There are a couple of different agencies and Mother Nation is one that has the advocates as they're able to volunteer and learn. And then when there's opportunities for employment for as a sexual abuse advocate, they may be hired into that position and their title is survivor advocate. It's very powerful. Michelle, do you have anything to add to that? Again, it's just, it's layered, right? The, this empowerment is layered with the collaboration. When I talked about with Brit and Googling something, 
and, you know, saying, here's how I got this information. Um, it's, I'm not trying to hold information secret or for my profession only. I want all information to be available to you so that you can, you know, do what you need on your own if that's what you choose, right? Okay. Um, cultural fostering cultural relevancy or uh, cultural humility. Um, and, you know, Hansel started talking about <clears throat> some of these pieces and, and please everybody jump in. We're all, um, we all have culture. We all have cultural communities that um, provide us resilience. We also have cultural community aspects that harm us as well sometimes. Um, that <clears throat> those are all things to, to kind of explore. That um, we want to be fostering that culture has a part to play in our trauma and our healing um, and that it's important as well as systems of oppression um, that have impacted us before our trauma, during our trauma, and after our trauma in our service kind of help seeking, right? Um, Trauma-informed services takes social and political factors into account, right? That <clears throat> I have to be aware as a service provider in my community that there is a, um, that there is big anti-immigrant sentiment happening politically and socially. And so if I'm trying to be open to um, immigrant survivors, that I have to do more and different things than maybe I was doing when there might have been less uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, although um, th that may or may not have ever been. So we are thinking about what's happening in the world and thinking about the fact that maybe our Spanish-speaking advocates on the way to work, uh, we're told at the gas station to go back to Mexico or to speak English because this is America, right? That our clients might also be having that experience, that that is part of their healing and it's also interrupting their healing, right? That um, being able to, uh, th that it's like a, a setback all the time, the experience of oppression, uh, the experience of of barriers to service provision through not being able to have access to an advocate who uses ASL or an advocate who speaks Spanish and has, uh, or an advocate just looks like you or, you know, understands that your pronouns are they and them, you know, the, all of those different things are really important. And thinking about like, you know, not just the right now, our social and political kind of reality is um, is of a lot of white supremacy that's very overt, that critical race theory is being pushed out of schools, that um, that there's a big focus on, on the border and immigrant detention, that there's this um, attack on trans youth and their ability to receive you know, medical services, even if that's happening in Arkansas, that the political factors, the social uh, movement, the conversation on the news and in social media is impacting those trans youth that are right here in our neighborhoods. And that that's the kind of thing we just, we have to be aware of and make more of an effort when those things are more heightened, right? Because that's just bringing out more trauma uh, and we have to go to them. Uh, we have to be overt in our support to be able to say, this service is for you and we don't agree with what's happening in your community. And we understand that your trauma is layered because it's not just about the sexual assault that happened to you in your border crossing. It's not just about the sexual assault that happened to you when you were a young person by your brother and now you're trans and, and trying to transition, right? Like all of these things you know, is about you as a whole person and impact your, your culture and places where you experience oppression. Also, the meaning of violence and trauma really varies across cultures. Um, 
You know, some people might be talking about the machismo of their particular culture um, in um, Latinx communities, right? Or, and, and kind of really thinking about, you know, that aspect in their healing and in their trauma. In my community, in the queer community, um, you know, we get a lot of kind of internalized homophobia and transphobia about, um, and sexism about like lesbians can't hurt other lesbians, right? That the meaning of violence and trauma is different in those smaller communities. And so if I'm less familiar with the queer community or I'm less familiar with the Latinx community that I'm gonna be asking questions like, how like you said you're queer, how is that impacting your ability, you know, to heal? Does your community feel supportive to you? Where can you find resilience through that? You know, because sometimes we really feel resilience in a lot of people in our community or community leaders that have supported us, or just thinking about our, um, you know, our radical ancestors that threw a brick through a window or whatever those things are that help to make us feel resilient. So it's about being open to learning and asking questions and bringing those things kind of forward. And different cultures have different resources for healing and thinking about what those are as a part of that process. Um, the heart of advocacy is recognizing survivors as whole people. Sexual violence is a tool of oppression and the experience of sexual violence for each survivor cannot be separated from how racism and other forms of oppression affect their lives. Racism and other forms of oppression shape our societal ideas about sexuality and bodily autonomy, uh, relationships, our spirituality, and all these other aspects of our lives, right? That our experience of um, you know, how we've experienced the police um, in our lives based on the color of our skin or just the, the reality of our neighborhoods um, impacts whether or not we are going to report a sexual assault to them. Uh, these are all different factors, right? If we think that the police are going to call immigration, we're not going to report it, you know, the, to the police or seek help there. And so we have to recognize all those pieces um, that, you know, complicate and, and create the reality of survivors from all cultures. And there are so many cultures. And not everybody is experiencing their culture the same as someone else from their culture. So we can't, you know, we work with one queer survivor and their experience is X. The next queer survivor is going to be totally different. It's going to be Y. It's going to be Z. It's going to be X, Y, Z, right? So um, that's kind of what I have to share about this aspect of um, cultural relevancy and humility. So um, Patricia, do you have things that you would like to add? And of course, anybody, um, we have definitely have plenty of time for, for people to kind of throw in different aspects that they want to share around this as well. Thank you, Michelle. This is a really, really critical piece. And um, in this spot, I would like to share how we have different by and for organizations um, have people in this training. It's we've got Nuestra Casa, which is from Sunnyside, Basta Coalition, which is statewide. Children of the River, which is the Puyallup Tribe, Lummi Nation Victims of Crime Services, the Military, Mujeres in Action out of Spokane, Abused Deaf Women's Advocacy Services, Seattle, and the Seattle Police Department, King County Prosecutor Office. We have a variety of people that are taking this training and it's really, really, um, great when we have that because there are so many, so many different cultures and so many different layers. So you all bring your expertise to this too. And I would love to hear your um, 
comments or you can put it in the chat if you have anything else you would like to add. And I just want to say that we're all always learning, right? Until our last breath, probably, we're always learning. Um, I've been, you know, working um, in social services since I was 20. I'm in my sixth decade of life and I'm learning all the time and I love it. And um, when we approach something with humility, whether it's culture, what we're learning, the profession, um, the volunteer work we all do, whatever it is, that is going to take us that much further. And so it's really, really important. And it's really important to share also if um, if you have any um, anything you would like to add from your experiences, we would love to hear it or you can put it in the chat. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, military sexual assault programs. Thank you, Smitty. Yeah, please share. We have lots of time and space, so please share anything that you think is, is missing from this piece or ask questions about anything that we've kind of gone through so far today. And while you all are thinking, I'm going to share something that I learned. Oh, Boston Coalition. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so I we just had, uh, Wixup just held a keynote series. And I learned so much during that keynote series. And um, one of the things I learned from listening to a presenter was I had forgotten how young I was when I was told that I should be a counselor. This was seventh grade. One of my dear, dear friends, stepfather was sexually abusing them. I didn't even know anything about this, that it happened in families, nothing. And during um, our noon lunch break, we we're sitting on the grass and she told me I do not remember what I told her. I was what, 12 or 13? I was in seventh grade. But she told me various times after that, that what I said really helped her. I don't remember what it was. I think I just listened. I was in shock. I was like, oh, no, what, what, what are you talking about? And she told me then that that's, you know, I should work in this um, when I become an adult. And I'm like, Oh, there's no way. No, no, no. But that at that young age, and I hadn't thought about it until I heard this keynote in May. And that person shared that that happened with them also. I think they were in the fourth grade. And um, it's just really interesting. Really interesting how, how these things like waves, you know, like ripples come in and out of our, our lives and uh, how I really, I really do love the work. I've been in and out of it, um, but I really love the work and it's just, you know, you never know when that seed is planted in a fourth grader or a seventh grader or college or wherever. And it's like, oh, okay, I can do this. Some questions here in the chat about. Very good. Um, oh, uh, from Emily and Marissa about um, resources for people to do their own personal work around privilege and how to engage with different marginalized communities. Again, it's you know uh, 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 t kind of two separate pieces, but the first that I want to talk about is engaging with marginalized communities, and really, it's about nothing. It's that um, that saying from the disability activists uh, from the um, 70, 60s, 70s, nothing about us without us, right? That we can't just say, you know, here's how we're going to do outreach and, and rather say, hey, we do sexual abuse work. You do work 
with these particular communities, um, is there ways that you think we can work together or should work together? Or where do you see our work kind of intersecting and let's get to know each other about that? That I think that that is um, how we do work and collaboration. It's kind of like just, just like how we would work with individual survivors that's saying, I have this information and you have all of this information and without us working together, it's incomplete, right? Um, that that's kind of how uh, we kind of, you know, and I think just being honest about, you know, uh, I have my own experiences as being part of this community, but I also have my experiences of being white and having this privilege of being white and being, growing up, being socialized um, in school systems and in other systems in society where um, I, it has been internalized kind of superiority, whether I wanted it there or not. Uh, and that's something for me to um, be working on. And also just to be transparent of that when I'm working with somebody who's not white. Um, I think trying to ignore the elephant in the room is just worse than just saying, you know, hey, uh, I know racism is real. I'm a white person. I'm not going to know exactly all of the things that's happening. I have this knowledge and experience. You have the knowledge and experience of being you in the world. And so let's talk about and try and figure out what ways we have going forward. Um, knowing that I have incomplete information and you do too. And that everything that we do is about collaborating, that I can't do anything without, uh, without your information about what you need, want, what your experiences are and what your priorities are. Because if your priority is that I am totally traumatized that at the gas station on my way here, somebody told me to speak English, then we don't talk about sexual assault that day. We talk about that, right? That it's whatever is most present for you. Um, uh, of course, welcoming any, anything else anybody else would like to say about that um, before I move to Hansel. Uh, and I just wanna remind folks too that they can unmute and say what they have to say also. You don't have to just do it in the chat. Mm -hmm. We just ask that you say your name before speaking so that we can find you. Hansel says here, the piece about immigration status is very important. <clears throat> we work with a lot of undocumented moms with no social security numbers or um, that, I don't know what that acronym stands for, but it's a tax number. <laughs> Um, I mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just don't know what it stands for. I try to spell out for the interpreters anything. So I just know it's a tax number. And we have had to get creative about helping them find employment, making connections with employers, willing to overlook that and give them a job. And that's one of the ways we got to think outside the box. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Nayeli is from Nuestra Casa. Focus on immigrant women, ESL classes, and naturalization services. Very cool. Thank you for that work. Um, Hansel and wants they to collaborate come. with uh, Lighthouse in Sunnyside, Michelle. Oh, awesome. Uh, okay, yeah, um, we can make some connections for folks, Hansel. Um, no problem. Mujeres in action. In you all are in Spokane. Is that right? Um, this is Hansel here. Yes. Um, yeah, Mia works primarily in Spokane County, but we love to connect with any other agencies that are serving primarily Latinx um, communities because we, we definitely don't know it all and we want to learn and, and see how we can collaborate and help each other out. 100%. So. Uh, Lynn would like more information about immigrant survivor services for undocumented individuals. Yeah. And we're going to get into some of the legal aspects of that in session seven and some of the online work as well. We'll cover that U visas and things like that. Um, 
and Carolina will also join us uh, for some of those aspects. And she uh, has primarily been working with Latinx communities uh, and immigrant communities as well. And we'll share some of her information. It says, thanks, I can wait. <clears throat> I mean, we can talk about it at, at any time. So if anybody who's, who's working with um, undocumented survivors can answer Lynn's question, just kind of from their own experiences, anything um, that you'd say to Lynn um, based on this question about uh, immigrant survivor services for undocumented individuals. That would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, while we're waiting there, Kyle is asking about uh, approaching care for victim defendants, um, survivors of abuse who aren't the primary aggressor in violent relationships. Um, well, I, I have worked with victim defendants in when I was work, doing domestic violence work. It's not really part of our work uh, doing sexual violence, however, is something that I have some experience with sexual violence survivors. Um, <clears throat> I did have a, a survivor who they, the man broke into her house and sexually assaulted her. Um, and she, I think she shot him or she, I can't quite remember um, because it was my coworker who had this client. And then she was arrested for his injuries, even though he broke into her house and sexually assaulted her. This was many, many years ago, and I think things oh, would be different. But um, yeah, it, it, that takes a lot more work, um, a lot more um, kind of advocacy with systems around that reality. I would also go and work with our prosecutor's office especially the, the systems advocates there to kind of talk about how, you know, we identify those things to make sure that charges get dropped if there's a, an arrest or they don't get filed in the first place. Um, the police will arrest whoever they think is the primary aggressor. And usually the way they evaluate that is who has a mark that they can see. And abusers are very good at hiding marks. Um, and a lot of marks are defensive, like trying to get somebody away or um, just kind of stereotypically women have long nails and leave scratches is, a, is a kind of another piece. So um, there are um, a lot mm -hmm. of aspects to people getting arrested because it looks like they're the primary aggressor, um, even when that's not necessarily true. So it just takes a lot of um, kind of advocacy with systems partners, um, um, if we're able to do that, we definitely should um, do some education on that with um, those systems partners. And it, it is, it's a lot of work um, because people follow the letter of the law and it's not the spirit of the law. The law says, you know, identify the primary aggressor in mandatory arrest law of domestic violence. I'm really sad that we, as a movement, really pushed for that mandatory arrest law in the 80s. It has impacted, um, again, white feminism has impacted women of color negatively because this has also um, been a uh, more disproportionate impact on women of color and domestic violence relationships um, because of the lens in which police are viewing women of color um, because of racism and uh, massage noir. So, uh, all of those pieces um, are kind of our historical bad. Um, and I wish it was something that we could change. And the spirit of the law is about making sure that we're not sweep, that, that domestic violence isn't like a private problem, right? That's the spirit of why that happened and how it's been carried out and just in just more ways of using um, sexism and racism and kind of taking, you know, the, the easy way around, like, oh, the marks on this person, so I'm going to take the other one, um, has, it, it's a, just a big mistake that we made as a movement, and now it's really hard to get out of. 
So I appreciate you bringing that up, Kyle. And, and I don't have great, I don't have great <laughs> um, answers for it, other than to say it's it was probably a pretty big mistake for us to do. <clears throat> I'll go to the next one, Patricia, if you want to kind of go through this in our last minute together. Thank you, Michelle. So what are your thoughts? Think about, reflect on what do you think will be hard? What do you think will be difficult? And what are you looking forward to learning in the next seven sessions? And you can unmute or you can put in the chat. And I love that you all are sharing your contact information in the chat. That's great. Um, Sadie says, I'm worried about vicarious trauma. Courtney says, I think it will be hard. Rachel, transgender and gender queer inclusion in feminism as well. I think it will be hard to get emotionally attached. I think working in systems is going to be super challenging with the knowledge that systems are inherently racist and sexist. Woo! Legal aspects, especially undocumented victims and services available to them. I think advocacy to children of sexual assault will be hard with regards to the trauma. Yes. Yeah, all of that, all of that. And I want to, just with those comments, which were very powerful, I want to remind us that we're learning something and just as I mentioned with my grandson, Joaquin, he's learning how to walk, he stood up, he balanced on his two little feet. That's what we're doing right now. And we're learning and we're always gonna be learning. You're networking with each other right now. You're exchanging information. That's huge. So um, I like the analogy of the tool belt. You are supplying your tool belt, you're getting the tools you need. It's ongoing, it's fluid, um, different tools for different situation. And so keeping an open mind and realizing there is no way one person can know everything. There's no way. And so relying on each other. Yeah. And, um, you know, being honest with ourselves, which you all are being with your comments, right? We don't know what we don't know until we know it. And then it's like, oh, great. All right. And again, that that word humility comes to my mind, having humility and knowing that and not coming from our ego that thinks uh, we know everything. There's no way. It is humbling work. That's right, Michelle. That's right. And it's not for everybody. And so, yeah. You're welcome, Rachel, regarding the journal reminder. It really helps. Um, and if you keep it, you know, a year from now, you're going to go, whoa, look back and reflect and yeah at your growth and it can be a suggestion or maybe something you give to a survivor, a client that shows up, a writing journal as an option, as a resource, if they so wish. I love all the information, everything, everything everyone's putting in the chat. Very good. And again, if you would like to unmute yourself and say anything or have any questions, it's we've got a it's 1145 now. So
helping the kiddos I will be working with. Yeah. Separating emotionally. Self-care, taking care of ourselves will help us to keep that emotional detachment. And, you know, in AA, they talk about detachment and and it, it's real. You can love someone, but you've got to take care of yourself, too. And we need to be, um, that's what I'm looking for, objective, objective. And um, yeah, good points, everyone. Yeah, it, it, and Rachel, that's real, feeling helpless and um, Sadie. Uh, because yeah, it's not our choice. That can be really frustrating. So it's so important to just know that it's not. I, I was on the phone last night with my ex-girlfriend for about an hour who works with children in um, Oregon. And she was like, I want to tell you about this case because I don't know what to do. Um, and I was like, yeah, but after an hour, you know, she's telling me the whole story. And I was like, I didn't need to hear this whole story, but you needed to tell it. So that's fine. And also, you know what to do, and you're doing those things. Um, and why you're calling me and asking for help is because there isn't any help about this. That the person that you're working with is not ready to make changes or do things. And you're having your own experiences of your own child abuse. That is, um, that is what's up here. And I'm glad you called and I'm glad we talked about it. And that's why you can't figure out what to do for this person and are feeling it harder than others. So that kind of also goes back to what Courtney said too about like, what about when we, you know, hear someone's story that sounds similar to ours and they take a different path than you did, <laughs> right? They want to approach it really differently. That's a super hard place to be. And so... Um, yeah, so that's real. And that's just part of what we do and having those people that we can talk with, um, hopefully, usually from our own team, because of confidentiality considerations, is just being able to process that out those people that are our mentors and our colleagues that can process it out and say, hey, um, God, this is hard. And a lot of times, you know, what I say is, you know, don't tell me the story. Tell me your story. Because I don't need to know their story. What I need to know from you is like, as the listener, as the helper, what's your story? Well, my story is that I heard them say this and uh, I felt it in my chest and it reminded me of my mom. And, you know, that's where I can be supportive of you in a debrief, in a in supporting those um, vicarious trauma pieces, that ugh, that secondary stuff that we get. So figuring out how to process through that with someone else. So when I go back over here, I'm working with this person without ugh, that tightness in my chest and thinking about my mom. Smitty, yes, everybody has a story. And so we're gonna, yeah, you're always gonna come in contact with somebody who's like, this person is me. <laughs> And those are, those are the hardest ones. So. Thank you, Victoria. We're really happy that each of you are here in this learning community so that we can support our communities wherever we're at. Um, of course, we have 10 minutes left, so we're happy to stay and answer questions. But this is, we're done with our agenda for today. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording and we can continue to have conversations, but.